And then I think there's a big thing in how you tell people they're being removed from a program, you know, and um, there's, there's lots of cases that I looked at where youngsters found out on Facebook um, or they got an email or they got nothing and they found out because other people have been told they're going. And one person high up in sports said to me, well, well, I don't really like telling athletes they're dropped from programs. And it's like, well, no, it, it's a really hard and miserable thing to do, but get, get some practice, get some training into, and, and do it in the best way. Hi, I'm Naomi Murphy, and this is the Locked Up Living podcast, where we talk with a wide range of people about harsh aspects of institutional life. We also explore some of the ways to overcome them and to grow and develop. I'm David Jones. So join us every Wednesday morning, six o'clock UK time, for a fresh podcast. Today, we are delighted to give you the chance to hear from Baroness Tenny Gray Thompson. Tanny is a Welsh politician and TV presenter, as well as being a former wheelchair Paralympian. Over her Paralympic career, she won 16 medals, including 11 golds for wheelchair racing. She held over 30 world records and also won the London Marathon six times. She was also the BBC Wales Sports Personality of the Year on three occasions and received the BBC Sports Personality of the Year Achievement, Lifetime Achievement Award in 2019. A remarkable career, but that wasn't the end, of course. Tani has not only made history in the sporting arena. After she retired, she expanded her broadcasting experience and became the first wheelchair user to present on BBC TV. She's also been a key part of their commentary team since the Beijing Olympics. I got my own bit there because my favourite of all your TV work, Tony, is your show-stealing uh, appearance on 2012, where you were absolutely fantastic. <laughs> In addition, Tanya has held a number of advisory and consultancy roles over the years and also represented many charities. She's also been Chancellor of Northumbria University since 2015. Tanya's significant achievements have been formally acknowledged many times. She received an MBE in 1993, and this was increased to an OBE in 2000. She was made a dame. In 2005, for services to disabled sport. And in 2010, she was made a lifelong peer where she sits as a crossbencher. So, and today we have invited Tammy to, along to talk to us about her activism to make sport a safer place for young people. Welcome, Tammy. Really nice to meet you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thanks so much for coming on, Tani. We're really, really delighted to get the chance to speak with you today. And after a very illustrious career as an elite athlete, you seem to have continued to make phenomenal achievements. Lots of athletes struggle psychologically with retirement. How did you manage to make that transition more seamless and go on to be as successful afterwards? My parents were always really realistic about my sports career. So uh, my dad always used to say, you know, you can go off and be an athlete, but you need to get your degree and your education first because you need something to fall back on. So all the way through, um, it was, I was really conscious that at any point I could get injured, I could decide I didn't want to train anymore, or my team manager could ultimately say I wasn't quick enough. So I'd seen it in other athletes that when that moment comes, it's pretty quick for most people. And um, I, I didn't want the best thing in my life to be my sports career. And I think the other thing is my parents never let me define myself just as an athlete. So while it's the biggest part that someone on the outside sees of you, for me, it was a massive part of my life. But I, I like to think I'm a bit more of a Venn diagram. So I think I was always exceptionally realistic about what the end of my career would be. Because you know it's coming. So the other thing is, you know, we didn't have lottery funding for the vast majority of our careers. So you, you had to do other things to pay the bills and that builds your CV. So that, you know, I actually started planning my retirement at 21 and I retired at 36. So, you know, 
Um, I think sometimes people look at it from the outside and think it was like fairly effortless, but there was a lot that went into that. And I think for me, that's, that's really important. When I talk to young athletes, you know, I talk to them about what you want to do when you grow up. And a lot will, you know, think they're going to win a fortune um, or they're going to get a job in TV. And, you know, I say that I'd work in TV, but it doesn't pay my mortgage. You know, it's, it, it's, it, it's not, you've, you've got to have sort of different complementary skills. So I, I think I was just lucky. I always knew that I had to do something else. Yeah. Lots of really fantastic role modelling there, I think, for young people that are involved in sport. Because I think for a lot of people, it, it, or even though they all know it's going to happen, it, they just kind of like fall into it, don't they? And then I think that's that's when it becomes dangerous for people and they crash psychologically, emotionally um, and struggle. So great to, to hear how, how you manage the process and also to hear that it wasn't so seamless, that it was something you actually put a lot of work into planning and preparing for. Then in 2017, you produced a report, Duty of Care in Sports. Uh, what led you being commissioned to do this and why was this considered such a pressing issue at the time? So Tracy Crouch, who was then sports minister, had done uh, the first sports strategy, I think in 13 years. So it was a big deal for Department of Culture, Media and Sport and the sports minister to do that. And what came out of that was uh, a really strong need to do more work on duty care. And uh, I'd, I'd long had opinions on duty care in sport, some public, some not. And so I was asked to to do it. And uh, I was really clear what that meant. I think some people thought that what I was going to do was say, rank this governing body here, you know, really high, and this governing body sort of at the bottom and and, and rank every governing body in between. But the reality is that in governing bodies that were great, there were some things they, they could have improved on. And, and it's quite sort of a, a moment in time in terms of what governing bodies are doing. If governing body hasn't had that many cases around duty of care, then they could be perceived to be doing a great job. So I, I was really clear with DCMS that it was it, the root, because my, my remit was massive. And it, it covered so many different things, but I was clear that it was going to be um, about protection of those in the system. And and so they came back and said, we want it to be participants. I think in their head, they meant athletes and players. And to me, I meant coaches, physios, doctors, boards, the whole lot, because they're all part of this jigsaw that makes makes path pathway and, and elite sport. So um, it was a big piece of work. You know, um, it, it was over a year of my life. Um, and uh, I, I chose not to write a 300-page report that went with it, um, partly because a lot of people wanted anonymity. Like, I would say the absolute vast majority. I think, you know, probably I, one or two people have might have been prepared to go on the record. So I, I kind of figured out that there was no point spending another year writing the whole report the whys of it. So my view was that it was written in a way that was quite simple to understand. A 13-year-old in sport could pick it up, but uh, someone who was deeply embedded in elite sport could pick it up. And if you knew sport, you would know why I made those recommendations. And and to anybody who works in sport, who who say they don't know why I made the recommendation, my challenge back was, well, you don't know sport. Because actually none of them are complicated things. I mean, there's some that, that have cost and... Um, like an ombudsman, is a little bit more difficult to bring in. But but I don't think you need 300 pages to justify why I had those recommendations. Why do you think people are so reluctant to to be, you know, clearly supporting and providing testimony to, to the report? Uh, that makes it sound as if it's quite controversial. Yeah, so some of it was really controversial and some of it was um, very obsessing to listen to about how, People have been treated in, in all sorts of different ways through their various sports. Um, really difficult things to listen to from lots of different areas of the system. It wasn't just athletes, players coming to me. Um, I think there's a real challenge to whistleblow in sport. And I think, you know, some sports, even the big ones, everybody knows each other. And it's really hard to... Um, to, to raise issues and complain. And I think for a lot of people, 
you know, it, they're worried about their careers. You know, if they were seen to rock the boat. And there were lots of examples of, of people in the system who had raised challenges and then not come out of it well. So I think, you know, it, it was very difficult. And I wanted people to be really open and honest. I mean, the other thing I think that's important to know, you know, I wasn't able to, you know, fact check, fact check every single thing that people told me. I, I had to just try and join the dots. Uh, I spoke to a couple of hundred people in the end and we have focus groups. So it, it was a, a pretty decent number of people I spoke to who, who, who were willing to, to come forward. Um, and, you know, I did go out and, and actively seek people who were having a great time in the system. The reality is when I'm doing a piece of work by duty care, the ones who come to me are the ones who aren't having a great time. So I did work really hard to kind of balance up all, all the different views. But it's, I think the vast majority of people wanted to do things to make it a more positive experience. And there's loads of positive experiences, just the ones that aren't are really challenging. And for me, it's about raising the bar on everything. And, and it was quite interesting that I had, um, you know, a couple of people tell me that, you know, don't define duty of care in your report because there was an organization that were kind of lawyering up to throw out my report because they didn't like my definition. And so I just wrote in it, like, I'm not defining it. If you don't know what it is, then, you know, learn. Be because I think that general concept of duty of care, we, we all should should understand what, what it means. You know, I, I probably could have spent another year just defining it in a sporting sense. I think the other thing for me was saying, you know, that not, not everyone in the system is vulnerable, but there is a vulnerability when you enter elite sports system because it's, it's relatively small, you know. I, I, you know, even if you take the whole of elite sport together, it's quite small. So, you know, you, we, we have to understand that position, the power, um, and, and all the things that, that come with being involved in the system. Thank you, Tony. Um, the, the first thing you addressed was in your report was education. And from your own um, account, it was clear that you'd have that, that you'd have that instilled in you, the importance of having a good education alongside uh, whatever you're doing from the, from a sports point of view. A lot of the recommendations you make help ensure talented young athletes have a balanced education and don't have all their eggs placed in the sporting basket. Can you talk us through some of the recommendations that you, that you made in this area? Yeah, so some of it was around, you know, if if you're a young, talented person in sport, then you, you kind of want to do that sport, you know, but, but actually it comes back to the needing something to fall back on. And and needing balance. So, you know, some of it's a, a teeny, teeny bit of it is personal experience because when you're training well or you're training, you, you need other things to think about, basically, because you can't train, you know, 18 hours a day. Well, not effectively, you, you can't. So, you know, some of the things was about, you know, not taking children out of school, you know, full time. It was about, you know, thinking, you know, the, the absolute vast majority of young people, you know, don't make it, you know. So, you know, you at some point you are no good in your sport, but that's a very harsh way to say it. You know, even with the elite level winning gold medals, at some point you're, you're not there. So you need something to, to fall back on. So it, it was about having this holistic approach to talented athletes. So, um, you know, it was thinking about how they get education, um, you know, uh, thinking about having a, a, a duty care policy. I'm, I'm a firm believer in dual career uh, and, and that balance in, in your life. And th the one bit which, you know, I'm really keen on as well is that sports should measure and publish retention rates for those who've dropped off to see how they, whether they remain in sport. Because actually what we're looking for in terms of like long-term success of a nation, say it's Olympics and Paralympics, is how we recycle talents. And in a lot of sport, they make quite arbitrary uh, cutoffs at different ages. And I think we're losing talented people in, in sport by just having either an age group or they haven't found the right sport. So I, I just think there's a different way of doing things because as a country, um, you know, we won't do what other countries will do, which is put kids in training camps at five years old. So, you know, which I do not support. <laughs> Um, so we've got to find ways of being really creative with, with the talent. And also, um, a big part of me, I don't want youngsters to drop out of sport and then drop out of physical activity. 
because actually the physical activity bit is really important for lifelong um, health and fitness and keeping people out of the NHS. So I, I think there's there's more that most sports could still do in, in terms of that. Do you think you mentioned that about the age and the fact that we, you know, we do have a threshold of a certain we wouldn't have a five-year-old um, engaged in really hard training routines. But do you think we've got the the age right for sports? Because sometimes it seems as though children perhaps them like having to be hosted away from their their own families in order to participate in sports, or you know, still doing an awful lot at a very early age. And what does that do psychologically? You know, just thinking about some of the stuff around gymnasts and and so on, if they're encouraged into it when they're still children, is there a tendency then to try and keep their bodies as children um, in order to be able to perform some of the, the, the moves that they're expected to perform? Yeah, I, I think there are some sports where you have to be training harder at a younger age. Um, and I think gymnastics is, is one of them. Um, there's a whole debate about uh, choice and freedom of choice. And, uh, you know, what you explain to uh, children on pathway and parents and carers on pathway about what the next steps will, will be. Um, so I think, you know, that I don't think you should be saying to a eight-year-old, this will be the most miserable experience of your life. You'll never get selected. You'll never make any money. You know, uh, you'll, you'll get injured, but good luck. You know, I, I think that's the wrong way of doing it. But at the moment, and it's the thing that brings you in. It's that dream of competing for GB or winning a medal. That's the thing that gets you in, you know, vast majority of young people. And that's the thing that keeps parents and, and children engaged. So I, I do think that, um, you know, there has to be some thought to, to what that process is. And, you know, I, I was really lucky. I grew up doing a lot of prehab exercises before it was called prehab. We just called it, same with marginal gains. My training group just called it being good at sports. Um, and so I think there's lots of things around, you know, prehab, rehab, life after sport we can talk talking to, to, to young people about. So I think at, at the older age groups, you know, football academies, you know, my sport, athletics, they, they have cutoff ages. And I was a late developer and uh, I, I've seen, you know, I've been involved in sport 40 years now. So I see a lot of young people who are late developers or take a while to find the sport that they're good at if they're on talent pathway. So, so that's the bit I think we, we need to just be, you know, open-minded about. I mean, it doesn't cease to amaze me that, you know, we're only kind of now having discussions about menstruation, you know. And, you know, in my very early 20s, I was coached by a guy who was, I don't know, somewhere between 65 and 70, we talked about periods, you know, and obviously done, it was done in the absolute, you know, right way. But, you know, we, we need to be having some of these talks about puberty and menstruation and impact on training and, and all these other things to decide what talent, you know, talent is not something you pick on July the 1st each year. Everyone is on a, a different route through. And again, it's about getting the most talented into the senior system. Correct. You say I was I was very uh, struck by something you said earlier, uh, only about everyone becoming not good enough at some stage in their career, and of course that's so obviously mm. true, except when you're actually living the experience. You know, I can think of Cristiano Ronaldo, who I'm a great fan of, generally speaking, certainly first time round, um, who couldn't quite realise that he reached a point where he wasn't good enough. But I'm also thinking of all those dozens and dozens of young children who get recruited into the elite football academies and then discarded at age 15 or, or thereabouts. I think they must be, that must be our equivalent mm. of the kind of hothouse you're referring. And I think that's hard because, you know, I've talked about this openly. I've got a daughter, she's now 21, but. If I thought at the age of 11, she might have the potential in her sport to earn 250000 a week, I might not be that so bothered about her GCSEs. Although I think I would be, because if you earn that much kind of money, you need to know how to invest it and what to do with it. So um, I, I think it's that, it's that balance between selling the dream. And then I think there's a big thing in how you tell people they're being removed from a program, you know, and um, there's, 
there's lots of cases that I looked at where youngsters found out on Facebook um, or they got an email or they got nothing and they found out because other people have been told they're going. And so I think, and, and one person high up in sports said to me, well, and, and this was talk, talking about kind of adults on programme. Well, I don't really like telling athletes they're dropped from programmes. And it's like, well, no, it, it's a really hard and miserable thing to do, but get, get some practice, get some training into, and, and do it in the best way. And I think there are ways that the vast majority can have it done in a better way. Now, you, you might be in a situation where someone's in, you know, you're having to make a really quick decision that you can't necessarily be, build up to having a very long conversation about it. But, but I do think there's better ways in that athletes can, can be dropped. Um, and, and still it will be a shock to some. You know, some athletes want to talk about retirement, some don't. You know, some see it's a distraction, some don't. You know, um, it, it's not going to make it better and lovely and you can't make elite sport warm and cuddly. Certainly not at senior level, really. But, but I do think at, at levels leading up to that, that there can be a better way to tell people. And and I think the hard bit is like you're you're really 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 talented. Then you're suddenly not. And actually, you might still have loads of talent. You just only take in ten people out of two hundred and fifty forward. So you know it. You know if you talk about Cristiano Ronaldo, you put him against, you know, every player in the world. He's still you know one of the most talented players you know he could run rings around most people it's just that spike of level that that you've been at so um you know i i think there's just different ways that you can tell people that you know they're not part of the team i mean the, the competition team so i mean I, where sports i've seen it do it really well you know they they still involve ex-athletes they invite them back you know they give them tickets to things get a birth card. you know there's ways of being involved which is not about necessarily wearing the tracksuit and being on the team. So, the fact, I mean, that brings us very nicely to to the next question, really, in that actually maintaining involvement is one way to support people in having better transitions. But I wondered if there's some other recommendations that you could talk us through to help athletes have better transitions. There's obviously transitions into retirement, but either selection and for if there's something you might like to do, you know, like achieving. Uh, being selected to represent your country can bring challenges through it, can't it? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's, it's difficult because I was always really engaged in wanting to know everything about selection, deselection, what I had to do, what, you know, um, so, some athletes um, aren't really that interested for, for lots of different reasons. So I do think there's more that could be done in terms of, um, explaining to athletes and these are older athletes you know or athletes on pathway about what the the criteria is understanding about the appeals process so you know coming back to a personal level I always had my appeal written before selection for a major games because the way the clock ticks if you're not selected you get usually 48 hours it's probably you know sometime on a Friday afternoon that you're told and you, you can only appeal the process not the decision oh, so over the years, I've dealt with so many athletes who who got in touch and said, "I want to appeal. They should take me, not athlete X." And it's gone, but you that's you you can't do that. That's not how it works. So I think there's there's more things around, um, you know, transparent process for selection, um, having um, uh, independent people on the meeting that decides the selection process. Uh, I have to say that didn't put them terribly well with many people. Because actually, the selection process is quite political. You you know, a smart person can write a selection process to pick who you want, you know. So, you know, it's it's that kind of transparent. There, there still has to be room for that magic fairy dust, for a head coach, performance director, to, to look at someone and just think, there is something in them that I can't identify, but I think we need to give them a shot. But um, I, I think there's um, some of that can be, be clearer as well and you know the other thing is I think you know actually having athlete panels um where athletes are genuinely able to have an open discussion so when I was competing for a lot of my grips former strikes had you can have a really you know as part of an athletes meeting really open conversation with a you know it never felt that it was going to affect my selection to to have that um 
I've, you know, some athletes still have that, some don't. So, and it's things like exit interviews, you know, about, you know, understanding where the athlete is at that point of retirement. So too many people said to me, um, they're either introduced by the color of the medal before their name, or when they retire, they're just dead to that sport. The sport just forgets they exist. And, and when you've, you know, been part of a sport for a really long time, sometimes from being a, you know, a young child, to, to suddenly be sort of chucked out, I, I think there could be some better process along the way. So you're not part of the competing team, but you could be part. And also, I mean, this is a bit of a personal thing here, you know, I, I hear too many, you know, ex-athletes being told, oh, well, you can coach, go on, be a coach. Well, there's not that many coaching jobs and you might not be very good at it. You know, just because you're an athlete doesn't mean to say you're a good coach. So I think sometimes that's used as a bit of a catch-all, oh, we'll, we'll go and coach be, because you haven't had the education as you go along. So, you know, it's, uh, the, you can see why I didn't write the 300 pages explaining why I wrote the recommendations because, I mean, the, the, the thing is, a lot of my recommendations are interlinked yeah. and, and how you explain them on paper, um, yeah, probably would have been more than 300 pages. I think you seem to be highlighting fairness in, you know, the importance of fairness and the, the transparency um, and fairness and also compassion. You know, that when you think about athletes being introduced by the colour of the medal, there's not much, there's not much compassion or, or respect. For the individual there is it you, you're suddenly just an asset rather than um than actually the person that's in the midst of that you're a commodity yeah. and and i think again you know i'm, I'm quite that there is a level of influence in my own career that i could see that happening to me and i think my parents gave me a lot of resilience to deal with it so you know I remember, you know, coming back from a game where I did really well. My dad was the yeah, but you're still tanny, you know. And so um, I, I think when you're in that moment when you're being introduced as the gold medalist, as, you know, lots of people want to be a mate and, you know, you're sort of the, the favoured one in sport. It's a lovely place to be, but also, you know, when you're not in that position, then uh, it's a really hard place to be. So again, you know, me, for me, not defining myself just an athlete was really important. But I think the reality is a lot of people only think about themselves as being that sports person and the identity that comes with it. I mean, I, I retired in 2007, May 2007. I still have people who stop me in the street and, and sort of talk about my sports career. And just before I went out to Tokyo, I was at a petrol station and someone said to me, you're going to Tokyo? And it's like, oh, yeah, I am. And they're like, oh, good luck. How's the training going? And it's like, you know, at that point I was 52. And it's a really awkward British moment where I say, do you, do you think I'm competing? Or do you mean good luck for my commentary? Or do I just that? thank you, that's really kind. Because it was like, what? Well, so, you know, it, it's really hard. I, I generally thought for me when I stopped competing that people would not define me as an athlete. I'm still defined as that. I, I still get you're that athlete, aren't you? And it's lovely, but, but I'm not. And And I think it's hard when you, you know, lots and lots of athletes talked about it being a grieving process and that they'd lost something and they they didn't realise how big a part of their life it was until they were no longer part of it. So, you know, there's um I I was also struck by a huge number of people I spoke to, and this is really significant from the people who were athletes or players, who said, I would never let my child play my sport. Well, really high number. And that's kind of sad. That's really sad that, you know, someone's had this massive experience in sport, ups and downs. That's what made it what it is. But they would actively discourage their child from playing their sport. It is, that's really sad because that doesn't reflect well off what the end product has been like for the individual, does it, when they're reflecting back on their life. And it was, I think it struck me when you were talking by how um, significant your own family background of being one that was of stability and love and support and protection and actually not every child has that kind of ideal background does it and what happens if you come from a background where perhaps um there isn't so much love or safety and you're in in elite four you know what happens then in terms of looking out for you and making sure that you are being protected and not being exploited and 
being supported to make the right decisions. Yeah, and and, and I think that's really important because, um, you know, especially in the, uh, I'd say professionals, but where there's money to be made, you know, that exploitation could come in lots of different ways. Um, and we've also seen in sport, you know, the exploitation, uh, sexual exploitation of, of young people in sport. So we've got to think about that across all sorts of different levels and, and how we can protect and not, not all of it's going to be fixed by education, but, you know, um, around the sexual exploitation, um, and this also goes into, you know, the, the older age group is, is having conversations at an appropriate level, at an appropriate age about consent, about positions of trust, about, you know, what is grooming, you know, and, and, and some of these things to understand, because I think, you know, some of the stuff I've seen where it's very, very uncomfortable was, um, you know, a, a case that I was looking at where they said to me, um, but he's a good coach. Okay. Right. Really? Do, do you want to have a think about what you've just said? Really? And it was like, and you know, it's, it, it's some of those things that we, we need to, to educate him. Cause again, that dream, we've seen it with the, the young men in football, you know, that dream overrides lots of stuff and there's some stuff it shouldn't override. You ultimately, you know, when training's hard and miserable and I live in the northeast of England and you train in the middle of winter, it used to be pretty miserable. You need that dream to keep you going through it, but but not not that end of it. Thank you. Um, I must say, Tan, it's really brilliant listening to you talk here. Um, but to move on, um, we were interested to see you to include two themes which have been quite widely developed in the... Uh, public uh, sector, that of uh, including the participant's voice, which we might think of as the idea of lived experience, and also ensuring more attention is given to mm. equality, uh, diversion and inclusion. So what action would you like to see taken to address discrimination more effectively? Well, I think if you look at equality, diversity, inclusion, it's actually getting or giving the opportunity to the the widest number of young people a chance to play sport and um you know if we look at say olympic sport where we've been traditionally very strong it's rowing it's cycling sailing you know and, and actually across the whole piece you know some of these sports are not massively diverse um and uh i think we also need to be looking at something which has been talked about in business for a long time slightly less in sport is about socioeconomic diversity in terms of, you know, actually talent pathway now costs thousands of pounds a year for a child to be on. So you've got to be able to, as a family, afford it. And, and especially now you layer on, you know, cost of living crisis, sport and pathway sport might be seen to be as an extra that families can't afford. So for me, it shouldn't be just whether your family can afford to get you to the next level. It's about you know, democratizing pathway to, to bring in as, as many people, um, as we can. So, um, I'm involved in Yorkshire cricket. I joined the board last year. The pathway has been transformed in the last year. So, you know, in terms of the questions that we ask young people about why they play cricket and, you know, it's not now whether your dad play cricket or your granddad play cricket, it's just, you know, I shouldn't be part of the, the next step, but, but actually removing the cost barrier. So, you know, we, we've got to think about um, and I do it because I care, but, but often it's about getting the most talented young people in, you know, talented people just don't, don't just come from families that can afford talent pathways. Um, so, you know, it's, it's about opening it up as, as, as much as possible. So, you know, it's, it's hard, the pathway stuff's hard. I mean, it's, it's hard getting people in, engaging them, keeping them, you know, uh, you know, the. The kind of that balance between choice and sacrifice is is a really interesting one because you you kind of need to have a little bit of both for it to mean something. But um, yeah, I I don't think any of our teams are representative of British society. Um, they they're shifting a bit, but um, yeah, we we need to do more. 
Yeah, still a bit of a journey to travel, I guess. Mm -hmm. So your report also reflects on what's needed in relation to safeguarding. And since 2017, you've been you know, prominent in advocating for mandatory reporting of sexual abuse. There seems to have been some resistance um, to, to that generally as a, a, a topic. Why, why, where do you think that resistance comes from? Uh, I think there's a couple of parts to it. So we, we finally got positions of trust legislation across the line last year. And the pushback I'd had and others was that, oh, uh, a coach has never been in a sexual relationship with a 16 and 17 year old. Okay. Uh, I think there has been. And so I think there's a bit of worry about sort of being seen to lift the lid or, you know, I, I had things said to me um, in one case, but they're legal. So, sorry, what? You know, because it's that it's the position of power that you know, and you know, I mean, there's so many less to it. The other thing that I had pushed back on is, well, what if a 21 year old female coach uh, was coaching on a British program, a 17 year old boy, and it's like, well, then you absent yourself from you know selection and you do all sorts of things, you know. But I'm I'm not kind of talking about where's a 17 year old and a 19 year old i'm talking about a 17 year old and a 55 year old you know and and i think there are ways you know to, to to work through that so i think there's a bit of reluctance because it was just if you lift the lid what's going to happen the mandatory reporting's been really interesting because i think people some some people saw it as me having another go at sport and me saying, oh, you know, I'm accusing people in sports of abusing children. It was like, no, no, I'm coming at it from the point of sports clubs and coaches and people in sport have have very positive contact with young people. And sport could be a way of helping identify children who are being abused. So it's it's not me slamming, co you know, there are incredible coaches in, in this country who do amazing stuff. And I think a lot of the time, you know, the... the some coaches do get slammed for stuff. So for me, it was about um, protecting all young people and where young people come into contact with with, with adults. Um, so I've got a private member's bill. I found the waiting list. Uh, I, I did offer the government last week that um, they could take my bill and run with it. I would very happily hand it over to them. Um, they, they haven't yet taken me up on that. But... Um, I mean, I think the case for mandatory reporting is compelling. I mean, some of the other pushback we get is cost. Oh, what price? You know, um, I, I do think it's something that uh, we need to keep keep working on and pushing because I think it's it, it's something that's really important to protect young people. I mean, sport at its best is amazing. It is just, you know, what it can give you, whatever, like, you know, whatever level you play at, it can give you so much. But there's a teeny bit of a dark side to it as well. And, you know, we, we need to, to stop some of that happening. Thank you. So there have been a lot of, you know, quite high profile cases or situations in recent years. Do you think sports clubs recognise how likely they are to be targeted by those who want to abuse children? Um, I've seen loads of good practice, uh, loads of people who, you know, genuinely care and do the right thing. Um, but I think sport is one of those places. I know there's other areas where people who want to have an unhealthy relationship with the child will try and find a way of getting two children. And, and or, you know, uh, I, I mean, that counts for older as, as well, you know, just, um, you know, getting to young men and young women, not just children. So um, I, I think, you know, sport has to be really mindful that it's one of those spaces that people do do try and get to. But I, I think I'm eternally optimistic uh, about change or, you know, about the power of sport and and the good that it brings. You know, we just need to, I keep saying we need to do more. I mean, the frustration for me was, you know, um, 
DBS checks when the coalition government watered them down um, and having a conversation with officials where, um, you know, they were talking about sort of um, line of sight over children and, and coaches and me trying to get across them. You know, it's not on field to play that the, the abuse happens. You know, it doesn't happen in a public environment, but that's where the grooming takes place. And sometimes it feels uh, a bit endless that we're having to explain some of those things. Um, and, but, you know, there's a whole team of people in Parliament outside that are really committed to keep working on, on this area. And, you know, also, if, if mandatory reporting got in, it wouldn't pick up every single case, it, but it would pick up an awful lot more than, than is, is, is currently happening. Yeah, well, I suppose things have moved on a bit since the Jimmy Savile situation, uh, which, of course, you know, they're all, it's a highly complex uh, picture, isn't it, where power is involved, fear, profit, all those kinds of things can be caught up in these situations, although we do seem to have moved on a little bit from there. But do you think there is yet a kind of discourse about these issues, at the very least in the in the biggest sports clubs? Um, I think uh, in terms of the sports governing bodies I speak to, sports clubs, they, they have a lot of conversations about it. It's, um, it's, it's how you identify people who are very bright at the persona that's presented. And, you know, some of the public cases, you know, like Jimmy Savile, there were lots of people taken in by the fundraising and the other side of it and the personality. Um, I also, I want to hope that the idea of being able to raise some of this stuff is is taken differently. Uh, you know, my very early 20s, I, I raised an issue in a, a sports club that I was part of about, it, it was it, it was creepy behaviour. And and it was just like, oh, well, what do you know? You know, that was in the, the early 90s. I, I kind of, I do think where it's moved on is that a more open discussion about some of these things would would make it a little bit easier to report, but you can't, I don't think we can be complacent about it either, you know, in, in terms of, um, you know, the, again, it's that position of power, position of trust, how hard it is to stand up and, 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 and say what's, what's going on. So, um, you know, looking back at some of those things that happened in the seventies and eighties, it, it, it's almost, you, you kind of think how, but, but it it happened, and um, the the people who we don't want to be involved in sports, they potentially become ever better at, at hiding. So we need to be ever better at not allowing them to hide. So something though about being willing to see what's what's going, you know, a bit like you said about the creepy behaviour. So I was living in Leeds uh, around the time that Jimmy Savile died, and everyone everyone spoke about the rumours that he was a paedophile. So I think, well, actually, we had nothing to... We weren't involved in, you know, our, our worlds didn't correspond at all. So if it was kind of something that was being rumoured in such a big way, you kind of think them, there must have been... Why weren't people being a bit more curious about creepy behaviour? Or And actually, sometimes people might be accused of being creepy and there'd be no substance to it. But I think it was something about being willing to ask questions and be curious if there are rumours or suspicions about people. Yeah, I get it. it's those people in the position of power actually being self-aware and listening and I'm prepared to, to step up, actually. And, you know, I think, you know, sometimes when you raise issues in sport and outside, the, some organisations just don't want to hear it. You know, whistleblowing is a really difficult thing to do. Um, there is a private members bill on whistleblowing in the system as well in terms of offering protection to whistleblowers because, you know, 
a lot of these cases only come out because of that. And, you know, actually whistleblowers should be protected, you know, not, not vilified. Thank you. Tony, you come across as being a pretty resilient individual. And earlier on, you were talking with Naomi about how important your family has been and how in a way they, they uh, suckered the kind of resilience that you uh, developed. What do you think a resilient promoting sports club would look like? Oh, that's a good question. I don't, I don't think I've ever been asked anything quite like that before. I mean, I mean, I have to, personally, my resilience goes up and down. Um, I generally had a pretty okay time in sport, ups and downs, but I kind of want more people to kind of leave their elite sports career feeling pretty balanced about it. I mean, the top 10 best and worst things in my life are probably around sport, apart from my parents not being around. But, you know, so it's the kind of the yin and yang with it. I think what a resilient sports system would look like, it would be ones where, you know, you come out of it at the end, you know, okay, or, you know, better than okay. I mean, I had a, a kind of quite a, uh, an interesting conversation with someone in elite sport saying, you know, we need to put people back together at the end. And they were saying to me, well, we shouldn't break them. I was like, yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not saying it's okay to break young people along the way. We put them back. But, but there is an element of what it takes to be an elite athlete. It is not balanced, you know. And, but it's understanding, I think, that it's, it's not balanced is part of the, the process. So, you know, I think what I see as a positive is someone gets to the end of the career, recognises there's been good bits, bad bit. You know, there's been, you know, up and down. I, I didn't quite mean bad bits in that way. You know, abuse, you know, um, you know, bullying, that, that's got no place in sport whatsoever. But, you know, some of the things that happened to me in my own sports career made me stronger as a person now. So, you know, I was talking to one governing body a while ago saying about how it's not a big sport, about you help, how you help young people who dropped off programs. And I was saying, you know, things like CV writing, about if you're going to college or university, helping to articulate on your, your forms what the sport's given you. And I think they thought I meant for them to write the, it was like, I'm not telling you to write the CV, but there are things that you can help young people about, you know, planning, about, you know, pressure. You know, there's these things that youngsters at 15, 16 might not have the language or for, but you can help them understand what, you know, what sport has, has given them. And again, you know, I had a lot of that. So I think, yeah, the, the system can... Um, help people i mean it, it, there is a bit rich coming from me who did well as an athlete to be talking about the benefits of elite sport um i think i've been around long enough that i've seen so many people come through the system and come out the other side in in different places i'd like more people to be coming out in a better way brilliant so finally you're you're clearly a very active person you've not sat back on your laurels at all you've battled for various causes and it can't be easy i wouldn't have thought uh, to be working in the house of laws trying to get things achieved there how do you look after yourself and keep yourself healthy and wise um, not about the wise bit um, um i mean I, st I i try to be active you know um it's a bit harder these days. You know, I try to eat well. I try, I was going to say, I try to sleep. My sleep pattern is atrocious. But I think because I know it's atrocious, then it's not quite as bad as it might be. Um, I do do try to, you know, that self-care bit is really important because you have to kind of keep coming out fighting. Um, what keeps me going is the people around me. Um, either, you know, the, the people in the system that I've spoken to where you're just thinking, I wanted their experience to be better. And my family is still a really big part of that. My husband, sister, daughter, um, you know, are, are three really important people in my life who, who've lived through my sports career with me, um, you know, really up close. And, and they're the three that, that keep me going in terms of what we're trying to do. Um, and sport is amazing. You know, it can be amazing. 
Um, and I, I just started playing basketball again after 40 years. I am so rubbish at it. And um, I, I went to a training session. This sort of like 13-year-old that, that was in the training session said to me, have you ever played any sport? It's like, yeah, but. And then he was like, I think you're the same age as my grandmother. Oh, that's lovely that you come out on a Friday night and, and play basketball at your age. And it was so funny. It was really sweet. And uh, I remember thinking that's that's the kind of reason I'm doing it because this is someone who's got this, wherever their career goes in sport, you know, they've got a future playing the sport and um, it, it's worth it to, to, to try and make that a bit better. Tony Gray Thompson, it's been a delight talking with you today. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Holly.